welcome to the Madden America podcast, your source for science, psychiatry and social justice. Hi, this is James and welcome to the podcast. And this week we discuss a recent paper that considers the support provided by online support groups when people seek help for psychiatric drug withdrawal. The paper is entitled The Role of Facebook Groups in the Management and Raising of Awareness of Antidepressant Withdrawal. Is Social Media Filling the Void Left by Health Services? It was published in the journal Therapeutic Advances in Psychopharmacology in January 2021, and I'm really pleased to be joined by all three authors. A little later, we will talk with Professor John Reed and Dr. Ed White, but first, I got time to talk with Sherry Julo. Sherry is the administrator of a large online FXOR withdrawal group on Facebook, and she took time out to talk about what led her to start the group in 2013. Sherry, thank you so much for chatting with me today for the podcast. And um, I want to go on to ask a little bit about your thoughts as the moderator of a large Facebook withdrawal support group. But before we get to that, um, I know that you've had personal experience yourself of uh, difficult withdrawal. So I wanted to ask you if you could share a little bit about what you went through. Well, my doctor had tapered me off too fast off of Effexor. They wouldn't listen to what I was enduring, my withdrawal symptoms, which at the time I did not even know they were withdrawals. I didn't even know you could have withdrawals from antidepressant. My symptoms were so horrific that I was so desperate, I didn't know where to turn except my computer. And when I decided I would try to do a Facebook group. And I actually had to have an admin from another group walk me through how to set it up because I had no clue how to do it. And this was, this was 2013, is that right? Correct. Next month will be eight years. Sherry, can I ask, how, how long did it take you to, to taper off? I took Prozac most of my life, 20 milligrams. So. I asked my doctor to put me back on Prozac. I had only been on Effexor a year. And at the time, I was on 150 milligrams. I asked her to taper me back to Prozac. She tapered me back from 150 milligrams to 40 milligrams of Prozac over two-week period. And the first day that she dropped me from 150 milligrams to 75 milligrams, I was hallucinating. I was shivering. I was sweating. I, my body was jerking. I, it felt like I had bugs crawling under my skin. Um, the symptoms were horrific. Did your doctor recognize that that was withdrawal or did they have no idea? No, she did not recognize it as withdrawals. In fact, she told me to go to the ER, the a hospital, a mental health hospital ER, and check myself in for outpatient treatment. Um, it was the ER doctor who actually told me I was going through withdrawals. And he said no, he would not check me in for outpatient treatment. In fact, he tried calling my uh, doctor, but her office had already closed um, because he was not happy with her and her advice. Actually, that doctor ended up sending me a letter telling me that I was no longer a patient of hers. And the second doctor that I was seeing that was polydragging me, I mean, each time he would prescribe a new drug, it was just making my symptoms even worse. He got to the point where he told me I was non-compliant because I wouldn't take his drugs as prescribed, you know, that he wanted me to take. Even though they were making me, my symptoms worse, much worse, he deemed me non-compliant. Not only am I going through a horrific time, mentally and physically, but then I'm not getting the support, any support from the medical field that I desperately needed. 
Obviously, you know, you went through a really difficult time getting off. And like many people and like me, you know, you, you had, it seems, pretty poor advice from your doctor and, and had to turn to online support. So before we go on to talk about the group, Sherry, you know, can I ask how, how are you doing now? Are you completely past the withdrawal or are there still effects from it kind of hanging over you like there are for so many? I still have a lot of symptoms that uh, keep me from functioning a normal life, the life I had before. I had no idea. I was clueless. I associated withdrawals with street drugs. I was very naive. I was desperate for answers, and that's when I started the group to see if anyone else was enduring the same thing I was. And I was so relieved to know that I was not the only one going through this. I started the group during my initial two-week taper. It was right after my two-week taper where I was experiencing all these symptoms and symptoms, and I had no clue what was going on with me. I really didn't think anyone would join to begin with. I thought I was wasting my energy that I didn't even have just trying to get it up and running. You know, I had a few people join, you know, here and there, and I was shocked that people were even joining. Uh, the first year, I had about 100 members, and we were sharing stories, but we were all still kind of in the dark. We were all still looking for answers. Many people describe, you know, when they when they join these groups or when they start these groups and they see people relating similar experiences, that it's quite a shock actually to find out how many people are experiencing similar things and getting very poor advice. Right. Actually, too, I was shocked at the different ways doctors, I guess, their advice for patients. Some doctor, some doctors would tell them. Tell the members to, they could just stop their medication, or um, other doctors would tell them they could alternate days and then stop. Other members' doctors would tell them that, you know, they could bridge them to another medication. I was just shocked at the advice that these members were getting from doctors that were so different from one another. And so, Sherry, you know, your your group, I mean, it's a huge group that you look after with others. It's six and a half thousand members plus now, isn't it? And, and you know, I just wonder what your reflections are now. So I think you said it, it's, you know, it's coming up for eight years and you've obviously got a huge amount of experience now. And I know myself from being in these groups that some people join in a very distressed state you know they've really got themselves in a very difficult place with tapers that have failed and you know perhaps their doctors don't believe them so i just wondered what your thoughts and reflections were about what you've learned uh, in your time looking after such a big group i've learned a lot over the past eight years um i've done a lot of research trying to fix myself and so i can actually pass that information on to members in the group to help them I've learned that what works for one member or person may not work for another. What our group uses is a non-pharma approach to healing. So natural ways of healing. to That way you're not disrupting or compromising the central nervous system any more than it's already been done. You know, we encourage a healthy diet, exercise, um, coping skills. Coping skills was a lifesaver for me because I couldn't tolerate supplements. I was bedridden for three years, basically. I There was really no way for me to be able to cook and prepare like fresh organic food. So I had to work with what I had. And coping skills was a lifesaver for me. Uh, it, it's interesting, isn't it? I think it goes to show that I think the view of Facebook groups like yours uh, and the many others are they're there to dispense medical advice, but that's not what they're doing. They're providing a lifeline and a support mechanism for people that have had poor advice elsewhere from professionals. And, you know, professionals can't really 
give the same kind of support that you get in these groups can't they because they're not there in in the small hours of the morning where people are struggling and desperate to reach out you know they, they can't provide ongoing almost continuous support like many of these groups do right and empathy i mean and in my case and what i've heard from others you don't get empathy from your doctor and a lot of people when they join my group they're so relieved to find out they're not alone and that people care from what I've heard from our members. Doctors deny their symptoms. They'll tell them it's a relapse of their original condition, or their doctor will just tell them it's all in their head. You know, there's no empathy. Their doctors are cold, almost in denial of what their patients are telling them. They want to acknowledge it. It's heartbreaking. It breaks my heart every day. We add a lot of members every day and the stories that we read day in and day out it's heartbreaking so i couldn't do this by myself there's no way i i have a great team of admins and moderators that help me because there's times i have to take self-care breaks because i'm still not healed and we all do all the admins and moderators um you know we're all struggling so we do what we can to help but I can't tell you how many times members have told us that we saved their lives. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, I recognize that myself. You know, which is, uh, you know, why I think this paper was so important is to kind of lift a lid on a, a you know, a, a very important service that's been provided by volunteers in their spare time you know people don't get recompensed for this you know and they, they put their heart and soul into it and you know this is really filling a gap that i think the medical community are largely unaware of and really couldn't kind of hope to meet so you know this this old adage of don't get medical advice off the internet it's it's not quite as clear as that is it because if some people didn't go to facebook groups to get help and support they they would be in a very difficult place John Reed and Ed White, they did an excellent job on that paper. I'm very proud of, you know, the information that they put in the paper. And, um, you know, I wanted to help as much as I could, but they did, you know, most of the work. Yeah, they, they did, Sherry, that's true. But, you know, they are reporting on work that you and people like you have been doing for the last eight years. So, you know, I, I, I it needed the three of you to come together, didn't it? To recognize all the effort that's been put in over, over that time is so important. Right. Yeah, because there's several groups, not just mine. There's a lot of groups on the Internet, um, you know, face, there's forums or Facebook groups, you know, that are uh, most of us are all on the same page you know, trying to help people to the proper ways of tapering and through research we've all done. I uh, recommend that everyone do that, research. If a doctor recommends something, do your research. I've found that firsthand experiences are very important to read up on and learn from. This is my mission. I, I don't want anyone to have to endure what I've been through and what many others have been and are going through. So um, I will continue doing this, helping others as much as I can. Well, I just want to thank Sherry for talking with me. And I also want to pay tribute to all the admins and moderators out there that provide ongoing help and support to so many people. Most often, these are volunteers. Sometimes they're not in the best of health, yet they continue to put others' needs before their own. Next, I'm delighted to say that I got time to talk with John Reed and Ed White, authors of the paper, along with Sherry. We talk about the overall conclusions of the research and consider why it is that so many people turn to online support and advice. John and Ed, uh, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to join me today to talk for the Madden America podcast. And um, we're here to talk about your recent paper that you authored with Sherry Julo. 
and um, it appeared in Therapeutic Advances in Psychopharmacology, and the paper's entitled The Role of Facebook Groups in the Management and Raising Awareness of Antidepressant Withdrawal. Is Social Media Filling the Void Left by Health Services? And I have to say, I was so pleased to see this work done and so pleased to see this paper get a, a public airing. So um, to kick off, I'd just like to ask you both if you could kind of describe a little bit about the research, the paper, and what questions was it trying to answer and what were the main conclusions from it? Firstly, thanks very much for inviting me today. But very privileged and, and obviously listened to lots of your podcasts in the past. So very proud to be invited to participate. So the paper came about really through me suffering antidepressant withdrawal, which I will come to a bit more about my own experience later on, I think, um, recovering, joining one of these groups online um, and subsequently helping out, becoming a, a, a moderator and an administrator and, and uh, looking at the other groups around on Facebook and realizing that there's actually a lot of them and it's not just antidepressants. They help people, there's, there's, there's withdrawal groups helping people off benzodiazepines, antipsychotics, um, even mood stabilizers now, there's a lithium group just popped up. And so I, I started looking at group numbers, especially in, in Sherry's group in particular, and how quickly they were growing. Um, and then I thought, OK, I'll have a look around, see what the other groups are doing. So I just started to collect data in a spreadsheet, really. Um, just every now and then I'd go um, round all the groups, connect to the URLs, write down the numbers. Nothing nothing too startling in terms of, 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 uh, of you know, rigorous research. But then, you know, when I realized, oh, crikey, I've got something here. Why, why is this happening? Why are there so many people here? Um, why are these groups growing so quickly? What role are they playing? Um, and I started to put all the data together and looked at it in the context of research that was coming out. So John's paper on on, on antidepressant withdrawal with, with James Davis and, and other papers that were coming out. Um, and I thought, OK, I've got something here that's, that's worthy of public airing. So I contacted John, um, asked for his help, really, because... I might have doctor in front of my name, but it's uh, it's certainly not a medical degree in any, by any stretch of the imagination. And um, I, I, I didn't have the credibility, I don't think, to get it into the scientific literature on my own. Whereas John obviously is a is a um, well-established researcher and published so many papers. So I wrote to him, just emailed him one day thinking, OK, maybe this is worth a go. And um, it went from there. And I, I wrote the paper and John edited and helped put it together to, to get it through the journal editing process. Sherry contributed the data from her group. Um, and I think my, my main objective was to highlight what's going on here. The, you know, this is, this is something worthy of public attention. This is something worthy of attention from the uh, medical professions, psychiatric professions. Look what's going on here. You, you know, there, there, there are, Thousands of people, 60,000 in the private group, 67,000 altogether in, in the study, being helped by lay people to withdraw from psychiatric medications. Well, why is this happening? Yeah, absolutely. Those numbers leap out of the paper, I think. You know, it, not, not only in terms of the number depending upon each other for support, but also the growth rate of some of these groups, how many people are getting in touch. So, you know, I, I was glad to see that brought out. Yeah, very much so, and and they continue to grow now. I've I've continued to collect the data, um, and they're still growing at this, a similar rate to the during the period when I collected the data for the paper. It hasn't stopped, and I don't think it will stop. Really, the, the, it's a very um, successful form of support for the for the issue at, at the, in hand. And, and John, I, I was interested to ask. You know, we 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 live in a world where quite often you'll hear, you know, don't rely on the internet for medical advice. You know, we 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 get presented with that all the time. And yet, here's a a circumstance where you know users seem to be in the lead in terms of responding to these issues. So, because of that, was it difficult to get this paper published? Because it kind of flips traditional thinking on its head a little bit, doesn't it? So, w was it difficult to get interest in this, or or, or was it easy? Uh, I think it, it might have been five or ten years ago. I think the climate was right. I think there is so much now going on in the in the scientific world, but in the public arena and in the, in the media on, on this issue, and it affects so many millions of people around the world. Um, I think um, journals are ready to to take this sort of thing seriously. And the the joy of this paper is what it's shining a light on. This is literally thousands and thousands of people taking care of one another. 
I mean, I mean, take put all the other stuff on one side. It's just a, it's just quite a magnificent thing that's going on, with nobody paying any attention to it, or nobody in the experts' world um, of clinicians and, and researchers. Um, we we're all off operating on some cloud somewhere, and then down in the real world, people are actually doing the stuff that I mean, we're campaigning obviously for purposes in the NHS and so forth, and we think that's probably going to come. But in the absence of of that, people have just filled that void and are just getting on with it. I mean, it's there's a sadness to it in a way, I guess, that that that, that us professionals have been so negligent um, that people that's their only source of support. But I think even after we've got our act together and NHS is providing all sorts of services, um, there'll still be a place for people to support people who've been through the same thing to support one another. So it was a it was a joy to take part in. I really. I was really pleased when Ed emailed me. Yeah, and it's it's a rich source of learning too, isn't it? You know, that the fact that people are supporting each other and also there's an awful lot of information exchanged about lessons learned in how to help people with some really very difficult situations. And and so how you know, how was the paper received? You know, obviously people like me, you know, welcomed it with open arms and, and we're so glad to see the lid taken off something that we have been involved in ourselves. But what about professional response to it? What was that like? Um, I haven't seen a lot, uh, to be honest, James. Um, haven't, certainly haven't had any negative, seen any negative re- responses. Got a lot of media uh, attention, a lot of positive response from the media. Although even there, there was a there was an interesting story there. I won't name which which journalist or which newspaper, but they sort of got the story. They were on our side, but they got the story <laughs> a bit confused because they kept talking about these inadequate Facebook groups, and the whole point of the story was. That, that the Facebook groups are filling in for the inadequacy of the professionals. But they, to be fair, they corrected it as soon as we pointed that out. But I think there is that, that assumption that, as you said at the beginning, James, is that there's an assumption that it's not it's not safe, you know, um, stuff on on the on the internet. And and I'm sure you know I'm sure these websites are not perfect, and I'm sure there's some dodgy but well meant advice is, is passed from one person to another from time to time. Just as, as you know, there's going to be if there's sixty thousand people. We all say unhelpful things sometimes to our friends, <laughs> uh, so they're not perfect. But the point is, they are they are what they are, and that's and that's all that there is. So hugely valuable. It's, it's interesting. I um, I saw a Christy Huff, Dr. Christy Huff from the US, make a comment about. Um, you know, she she cringes a little bit when she sees some of the information that's being exchanged on, on occasion in some support sites. But overwhelmingly, uh, her her you know her opinion was that the groups are so supportive, have so much uh, sort of built-in experience, and help so many people that you know that that those mistakes of all that misinformation can be tolerated. And then, when you think about it in the context of, well, the health professions themselves, you know, effectively es- espousing misinformation by trying to rip people off these drugs just too quickly. It's like, you know, I think they can be forgiven for, for some of that uh, sort of uh, le- less than fully ethical advice they give because for the vast majority of the time, they're right. Even when they're wrong, I would argue that the people receiving the advice are grown-ups and uh, they're aware that the people giving the advice are not medically trained people they're people doing their best as we all do in life to give a neighbor or a friend our best shot at what we think might work so the people receiving it will take it with a grain of salt as as well and they'll probably get that's the joy of it. they get so many different bits of advice they'll take a conglomerate of all of that and hopefully take what what works for them and discard the bits that don't make sense for them but that's so even with those faults it's so much better than the the doctor who currently says well your withdrawal symptoms don't exist this is your depression coming back or your anxiety disorder coming back you can't get more misinformed and unhelpful than that well now you well your example ed was important people the doctors that acknowledge it and then take people off much too fast that's that's awful as well but there's but an awful lot just just refusing to see it. I mean, I had to do, and right, I remember what a couple of years ago did a, an interview on um, 
that BBC One, the morning programme, BBC One, I forget what it's called now. And uh, an ex, I won't name her, but an ex-head of the Royal College of GP said, I've worked with thousands and thousands of people uh, as a GP for 30 years, and the number of people with withdrawal effects I can count on one hand. So there's none to blind as won't see. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think also what you know having been involved in this world quite a lot myself it, it's the kind of psychological support and understanding that goes along with someone that's been on that journey in a way that you have isn't it and the fact that quite often support goes on these groups at three o'clock in the morning at the weekend when with the best will in the world you couldn't find a professional to speak to if you were struggling so you know that these groups it, it's partly about what advice they give but also about the way that advice is given isn't it I totally agree. Yeah, and uh, you know, the, the, there's a very important point you make about it. It's always on, always on. It, you know, a crisis helpline's open nine to five, uh, and if you're lucky, maybe a bit longer than that. Those groups are there twenty four seven, and most of them have an international uh, lineup of of moderators and administrators who are online at different time in different time zones. So Sherry's group's got UK people, Americans, and and an Australian guy as well doing it. There's always somebody there to answer a question, or as 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 you rightly say, the the, the community that grows around these groups is always there to support people at any time of the day or night. It's it's an amazing service if you think about it that way. From Sherry's point of view, I know how terribly badly she was impacted by antidepressant withdrawal. And, and as you said, James, from, from her uh, her account that she wrote on Mad in America, how she was bedridden, how, how it's impacted her life so terribly. In fact, you know, it's, it's been a completely life-changing experience for her. And for her to come out the other end helping thousands of other people online to avoid what she experienced. I think that's extremely commendable. I, mean, I, I can't, can't praise her enough for that. And, and, and as I say, I'd, I'd lump her in with all the other admins who do the same thing. They are a, an amazing bunch of people who spend much more of their own lives helping other people than they do help themselves, and they deserve a lot of credit for that. Mm. Yeah, these people are everyday heroes, aren't they? And you know, your paper kind of brings that to the fore. So again, it's it's just uh, it's fascinating to lift the lid on and see the data. But you know, behind the data are many, many personal stories that are being told. And and Ed, I, I wanted to ask you a little bit. You know, you, you obviously have a personal stake in this. You know, you, you have your own experiences, and you've also been a member and a moderator of of one of these groups um, in in the past, maybe. So I wanted to ask you if it's okay. You know, could you share a little? bit about your experiences of withdrawal and you know how you found the medical support and how that led to you perhaps getting involved with some of these groups yeah sure um so i tried to stop an antidepressant in 2017 um did it too quickly like a lot of people under the guidance of a doctor or with help of a doctor uh and ended up in a terrible mess um off work for five months severe symptoms horrible i mean it was without doubt the most horrific grueling frightening lonely experience of my life um i was very lucky i was able to reinstate the medication and recover a lot of others can't do that um and i got myself back together and back to work um in in uh sort of spring summer 2018 and when i'd recovered and um started to look around on the internet and explore and research what happened to me a bit more i found the groups i started to join them um joined a few of the online groups uh, on facebook and initially i just I, i'll be honest i found it too traumatizing it you know it brought all the memories of what happened to me flooding back and i left the groups and i left them all straight away you know i was in for a few weeks and i think i go in i can't i can't look at this i can't read what's happening to these people it reminds me too much of what happened to myself but I got I kind of got over that and went back and joined a couple of them again and started commenting, started to support other people, and then Sherry invited me to be a moderator and then administrator, and um, I carried on doing that for eighteen months or so, two years. Um, it, it's it's an enlightening experience. It, it's it's also a frightening one in a way. It's very emotional. Um, you you know people bear all in these groups, and 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 because the the, the the impacts of antidepressant withdrawal is so broad on people you know it's not just it's not just physical and, and, and emotional it's sexual if you uh, sexual side effects all it impacts people so broadly that you know and people bear all in these groups they ask questions about everything that's ex they're experiencing and some of what you see is very harrowing 
Um, you see people who really do struggle. You see people who are in a terrible state, but most of them can be helped. And and with careful coaching, careful um, support, and um, pointing people towards the, the 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 information that the groups contain, and other groups contain a lot of written information. There's lots of um, sort of uh, uh, short articles on on supplements, on to how to taper, on on coping symptoms. I mean, I started sharing a lot of the scientific papers in the groups in the hope that people would take them to their doctors and use them as as evidence. It's a it's an interesting experience. It's also a very time consuming one. You know, I have a full time job, and eventually the the job overtook what I was doing, and I couldn't give everything that I needed to to it, and and it ended there. But it, it's kind of life changing experience to view it. I think you realise just how many people are suffering, and just what a brilliant service these these these. And I think most important point to make these volunteers, these lay people these personally impacted people give back to all the thousands of people who join these groups. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for sharing that, Ed. And, uh, you know, it, it makes me think of what John mentioned earlier about it makes the dismissal of these experiences so much more difficult to tolerate, doesn't it? Because as an admin of these groups, you said it yourself, you see the raw and bridled horror of what people are experiencing. And, you know, to, to kind of have that... <laughs> you know, denied and dismissed and said, oh, it's only a few people that complain. You know, I, I, I think, you know, one of the real values of the paper and the work that you did is to say, look, there's real a real big problem here. There's real quality data, actually, that these groups are accessing. And there's probably a learning route to the future in terms of how we deal with the much bigger problem that we've still got to get to grips with. Absolutely. And I, I, I think these, these groups are an absolute mine of information, um, and and practical experience and um, practical experience of the you know, the moderators and admins, practical experience of the people who participate. Well, we 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 are doing it now. We are working with with others to to try and uh, extract that knowledge and experience from the groups and turn it into something practical that can be applied to healthcare. Because in my opinion, that's what needs to happen. Healthcare needs to uh, be willing to acknowledge the experience um, and that, that's there and use it constructively to help others yeah so as, as as part of that we've just ed and i with with mark horowitz and joanna Moncrief, two psychiatrists of uh just finishing off now aren't we the uh, design the survey um the, which essentially is to is to find out what works and what doesn't work um what was it about the groups or what what was it about the speed with which you come off or didn't come off and the keeping a diary not keeping a diary all, all of those things um because th these people have the knowledge they know and uh researchers can't find that out by um any of their efforts at the minute because we've got nothing to research because there's nothing happening so we, we're going to ask you know hopefully a few thousand of these folks to to tell us what the nhs should be doing um it's probably just while we're on that so the, the, some good news is that the nhs are are in the process of planning the implementation of some of those the Public Health England report recommendations. That, um, just to remind people, there's a big review by Public Health England of prescribed medication and dependence and withdrawal. And apart from documenting it very thoroughly, the extent of it, they they did recommend that there, there be support services, withdrawal support services embedded into the primary health sector, the GPs, and, uh, and a helpline. So they actually have formed a planning group now to implement those, which is pretty amazing given COVID. I mean, they'd have every excuse to not do anything at the minute. And they've, they've put uh, three or four people like myself on their advisory group. And if they weren't planning to do something, they wouldn't be putting people like me on their advisory group. So that's that's promising. That's promising. And I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to take a while. Um, and at the end of all that, as I said, we will still still need the um the self-help support groups um around the world they're, they're not gonna disappear i don't think but people will have some choices then so it's interesting isn't it you know the support groups almost provide a ready learning platform for official providers to look to to get the information they need to help people so in, we're not starting from scratch because of all the amazing work that's already going on each day yeah there's a template there 
there's a working template there. And I mean, you know, there are things that have to change. And I think one of the problems, <laughs> I don't think you could transfer some of the, uh, how can I put it, the criticism that these groups uh, espouse straight into a, into a health care uh, template because unfortunately they are they are quite anti-medical anti-doctor anti-psychiatry and I, I you know to a certain extent you can't blame them for that but you know I, I personally i don't blame the doctors and psychiatrists wholeheartedly i think i think it's a systemic problem but that there is still a lot of criticism in the in the groups of doctors and psychiatrists you know right rightly or wrongly um but it'd be very strange if there wasn't wouldn't it it would it would i i totally agree yeah and i mean it's a safe place to unload some of that and share and hear other people's anger it's got to feel not well, feel good but it's got to feel validating and yeah, I don't, I don't blame the individual GPs either. They have been sold the wrong advice for twenty or thirty years, and that advice, one way or another, has come from the drug companies. They've filtered their, you know, they've used their power to influence Nice, uh, the, the national guideline people, um, and they've just been filling, filling the GPs up with false information. And that's that's one of the major thing that major steps forward that's happened in the last two years that that flow of misinformation is now broken um nice has changed its guidelines even the royal college of psychiatry got its act together eventually um to do the right thing after 30 years of of minimization and denial so we've broke we've broken that and at the same time we've got this this because largely because of you ed and other people shining a light on this wealth of information and um, just at the right time it's all coming together, I think. Absolutely. Well, and, you know, there are some fascinating little details in the paper. And, you know, I, I encourage people out there listening to read it and, you know, we'll provide a link to it because it's it's such a good kind of analysis of, of what's happening out there day to day. But one of the things I was most interested to read was, you know, I think most of us in this position, whenever you read anything in the media on this, it's always never make changes to your uh, psychiatric drugs without speaking to a professional or, or an expert. But actually... In the paper, it says that the most common reason reported for joining many of these groups was a previously failed doctor or psychiatrist-led taper. You know, so I wondered, both of you, what your thoughts were about that. You know, what what prescribers can be learning from these groups? And also, you know, is that really calling into sharp focus this, you know, who are the real experts here? Is Is it the prescribers or is it the people that have actually been on the receiving end? In terms of who are the, who are the experts, we did a, a survey uh, nine months ago. Um, it got a bit curtailed because of COVID, so we didn't get the biggest numbers possible, but a survey of GPs. And they were uh, very honestly admitting that they they needed training. Um, I think two-thirds of them said they were not confident in their ability to tell the difference between a relapse of a depression and a withdrawal symptom. And that was very honest of them. Um and they they were up for it, um, as as you would be as you, as a caring people. And it's finally been pointed out that they've been sold the wrong information, and so they're they're keen to they're not the experts now, uh, and uh, and some a lot of them are willing to acknowledge that and and are keen to learn. So that's that's good news too. The process has started. I think uh, there's probably probably isn't a GP in the land who is not now aware of the fact that antidepressants can cause severe withdrawal. They didn't learn it from the Royal College of GPs. They, they learned it from the newspapers and from you on television, Ed, and lots of people doing all sorts of things like that and social media. Um, you'd have to be have your head well buried somewhere um, to not to be a GP and not know that there's a problem now. And that just was not true five years ago. So I think the process has started. And, yes, we all take a while to change habits, but I, I, it, it, I don't know. I, I'm not always very optimistic about speed of change in the mental health world because I've been around too long for that. Um, but I am optimistic at the moment about this particular issue. I think things are actually happening. One, one question I always, I keep asking myself is, really, what, what proportion of people are ending up asking for help with withdrawal in these groups? And I, I, you know, the prescribing statistics for antidepressants are horrific, especially if you look at the American st prescribing statistics, which I think we touched on in the paper. You know, they're, they're huge. 
so there must be a lot of people out there on these drugs long term. I think we know that. Uh, there's probably a lot of people out there who are suffering some side effects that they that are blamed on other other ailments. I know like Marion Brown comes to mind when I think of this and her 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 crusade and campaign to try and get um, you know medically unexplained symptoms etc better explained in terms of medication use, which I think is very valid. But I, I wonder just how many people out there there are that accept their relapse diagnosis and stay on the drugs long term, um, or worse still get switched to more drugs or given more drugs and I, I feel for them because you know emotional distress for me is not a perpetual illness it's not something that needs to be treated for life it, it's you know it's in response to to normal stresses and strains of life that, 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 that upset people and and it requires treatment and uh, yeah I, I wonder I wonder just really how many people out there there are that need help and how many more will come out needing help to get off these drugs if if suddenly healthcare was to be able to offer the right service to do it and you touched on something else that I, i've kind of become aware of myself as a you know as, a, as an admin of one of the smaller groups in you know that's mentioned in the paper i rarely see now people joining who say i'm just on one antidepressant or i'm just on the one antipsychotic or i'm just on a benzodiazepine I think, and this is only, you know, conjecture really, I don't have data to prove it, but I think I'm seeing more people who who have experienced polypharmacy. You know, they turn up and they're on multiple drugs. Definitely. And so we, there's an admins group, I think you were in it for a while, James, but the the evidence that the admins from all the other groups keep saying, or or the information they keep saying is we see so many people coming in on multiple drugs. And and most, as you know, most of the groups focus on one drug in particular. And there's a and that's one of the shortcomings is a little bit of reticence in some of the groups to help people uh, taper off the other drugs the drugs they're on. They're they're very focused on the drugs that the that the, the group supports or, or supports withdrawal for. Uh, but in fact, you know, the principles are the same for all of them. Um, you know, the, the, and the way to taper off them is the principles are the same. But I totally agree with what you're saying. Use of multiple meds is is definitely very evident, and and we have no we have no research at all about how the best way to come off medication when you're on three, four, or five. Is it? I mean, is it best to do one at a time? I w- I would think so, but that's that's so what? That's just my opinion. I've no idea. Nobody has any idea because there's no research into that at all. There will be some knowledge out there again. Maybe that's project number 17 for us, Ed, to try, try and get, get to the people who have managed to get off three or four and how did they, how did they do it. It's not um, a minority situation anymore. That's something that's changed over the last 20, 25 years. Polypharmacy has gone off the scale. It's quite, it is quite rare to be on only, only on one type of medicine. Yeah, and you, and you do wonder, you know, I... I, I, I think we know the answer to this question, but you know, how many people are aware that if they do end up on three or four drugs, they might have a five to ten year tapering experience ahead of them when they want to come off? Yeah, I mean that's the way I ended up when I, you know, my during my my withdrawal um, experience, I had the brush with psychiatry, so I ended up on three different drugs: so a benzo, an antipsychotic, and, a, and an antidepressant. I was encouraged to taper safely off the benzo um, by the health service, but uh, as for the other drugs, um, I wasn't and, and suffered similar experiences with those. But yeah, it took me, so when did I think about it? I'm still tapering the antidepressant now. It, t- it took me 10 months to get off a tiny dose of the antipsychotic they gave me. I started tapering the venlafaxine again in uh, September 2019, So, um, and I reckon I'll be finished maybe in a year's time. And this, this raises an issue. This is an area that only the doctors can do, in the end, that the Facebook groups cannot do, and that is give people the right information at the time they are considering starting on medication. The Facebook groups, by definition, aren't in a position to do that because they are at the bottom of the cliff, so to speak. And so that's the, the other major change that has to happen, apart from establishing su- support services within the NHS. We've got to get the doctors to get the right information to people so they can make a genuinely informed choice. And I think when people, I, I, I would imagine so many of the people on, on the groups that you guys are involved with would say if, if they had been told what they were about to, what they were going to go through five years later, they wouldn't touch the things in the first place. 
So I also think the information we're getting out through through the media and social media and so forth is going to gradually start, start reducing the number of people who go on them. I mean, the doctors will then start giving right information as well. But the information is getting out there anyway. I, I was predicting for the first time this year that the rate of antidepressants would plateau. It would be the first year in 20 years that it hasn't increased by 5% because of all the work that everybody has been doing in the public domain. Now, that's been messed up by COVID, so we don't know now. Longer term, I, th I think the rate of initial prescribing will come down, um, A, because the information is now in the public domain, and B, because doctors will start. The good doctors, and most of them are good doctors, given the right information, They've been, as I said, been told the wrong information. Now they've got the right information. They'll pass that on and people will make an informed choice. And a lot of people will say, no, thank you. Well, I think that, that that's a very important point. And the informed consent piece is really important. But also, if you know, if they are going to prescribe the drugs, I think the thing that I'd want to hear from a doctor is if, if I'm there in front of him in great distress looking for help, I am I was prescribed a drug. I want to know, you know, what the risks and benefit ratio is, you know, what and what am I getting myself into? But also, if I do get into trouble when I when I try to get off this drug, I want to know there is concrete support services there with the right knowledge and experience to help me when I get into trouble, rather than it being denied as a as a relapse or you know even worse emergence of a of a new of a new illness. And that that's what people want to hear, I'm sure, because I you know with all all good faith, I don't think these drugs will ever go away. And you know, maybe even they have their they have their place in in acute treatment, but long term, no. And I definitely want to know that if I do get into trouble, there's somebody there that's going to be able to help me to get get out of it. Yeah, I'm, I'm quite clear they they serve a purpose for some some people, especially in the short term. Um, and I'm not I'm not anti psychiatric drugs. I'm anti the lack of informed consent. It's a simple fact. Um, and, given the right information about the pros and cons, people can make their choices. But that just hasn't happened yet. But it's about to start, I think. And in the meantime, just to get back to the paper, in the meantime, while waiting for professionals to get their act together and start ignoring the drug company propaganda and talk about science instead, um, in the meantime, these thousands and thousands of people have been getting on with business. Um, and I just really grateful ed that you have to, you took it upon yourself that it's important to shine a light on this on these people and what they're doing so that a just because it needs because it's a magnificent phenomenon in its own right but also because it's going to teach the professionals how to do it thank you very much i'm i'm, I'm very very appreciative of your your praise and, uh, and i i i you know, I guess that praise needs to be passed on to all those people out there who are still acting as admins and mods. And there are some amazing people out there who, uh, you know, they're very, very, very dedicated to it. They, they seem to have great passion for it. They they work really hard to help the people who are in trouble. And, I, you know, I take my hat off to all of them. They're, they're amazing people. And we can certainly include James in that. So thank you. For yeah, in that. indeed. <laughs> well, thank you both. You know, it's, um, you know, I... I I often say, you know, I didn't know what friends I had until I started to struggle. Yeah, and that, that I'm reminded of that every day when I, I see the interactions in these kind of groups and the lifelines, really the actual lifelines given to people who are in so much distress. They can't see their doctor, they can't see their psychiatrist, they can't see a prescriber of any kind, but they can get an arm around them, albeit virtually, from the kind of support that goes on in these groups 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head there. Absolutely right. John, I, um, I want to ask you a little bit about your efforts because you've become known as someone who um, who supports patients in getting experience recognized and recorded. You know, we, we've spoken quite a few times now. You know, you, you were instrumental in me getting a podcast launched and, you know, off the ground and, you know, you, the support that you've given to Ed to do this paper and, you know, other things with the International Society for uh, psychological s approaches for psychosis. You work on ECT and, and you know, requesting a ban until the evidence is reviewed. So I just wondered what it was that kind of motivates you to get involved with people like us who are on the ground, if you like. Well, all I ever wanted to <clears throat> do, James, was be an ordinary clinical psychologist um, doing therapy and helping people. 
That's all I really wanted to do when I started out. And I just found that was impossible um, because the system was set up ass backwards. And um, it wasn't about helping people or listening to people or doing all the things that I had spent five years training to learn how to do, um, especially in my own area of psychosis. After a while of trying, bashing my head against a brick wall, um, decided it was uh, a more useful role to get outside of the of the actual mental health system and, and try and support change at a sort of meta level. Um, and uh, that's worked for me. Um, it's it's a it's been a long struggle, and we've lost as many as we've won. But um, I feel useful doing that and we all need to feel useful you know, i say it every time it's such a cliche now but it's another version of what you, what you just said james this is a very hard struggle but you sure meet the best people on on the way so um that's what keeps me going and uh, uh always will i reckon yeah absolutely well i want to thank you both for all the work for this paper it, you know it's um it's incredibly um, affirming, I think, to, you know, see the amount of effort given in supporting other people. And, you know, it's such a rich source of information, a source of data. It goes to show that support to people struggling can be provided if it's gone about the right way. And if we get over some of these, you know, some of this denial and minimization that we've we've become used to seeing, so I think it's opened a you know a whole new avenue of discussion. Uh, I think it's it's excellent work, and I highly recommend people to have a look at it. Thank you very much, James. Thanks, thanks very much for inviting me on here. I'm as I said before, honoured. Thanks, James. I just want to say a huge thank you to Sherry, Ed, and John for joining me and for their work. It's no exaggeration to say that online support groups provide a lifeline for people that are sometimes in desperate need of help and understanding. As we discussed in the interview, these groups are a valuable source of information and much could be learned from the efforts made in providing empathetic understanding, advice and support. The paper is open access, so to read more, just search for The Role of Facebook Groups in the Management and Raising of Awareness of Antidepressant Withdrawal. Or you can find a report on maddenamerica.com dated January the 18th and written by Peter Simons. So thank you so much for listening today. And until next time, take care. Thank you for listening to the Madden America podcast. Visit maddenamerica.com for more news, views and updates.